base training is so powerful that you can run your lifetime best in the 5K, in the half marathon, in the marathon, even in the ultra marathon distances off of only high quality base training without ever doing a workout. You know those workouts, those tempo runs, those interval runs that we feel we need to do to be sharp? You don't even need to do them. I'm not saying that they don't help, but base training is your key to running the best times of your life. In this video, I'm gonna share with you why base training is so powerful. And I'm gonna share with you a couple of stories from runners that are probably just like you. I'm gonna share a story about a woman in her late 40s who ran a lifetime best in her marathon off of just base training, actually coming back from an injury, and she ran really well. And I'm gonna share the story of a man who's in his 60s, who's been running his entire life, and he ran a lifetime best in his races as well off of just base training before he got into the workouts. So join me and we'll explore. Let's review really quick what base training is. We're not gonna go into the mechanics of it at all here, but I want you to just remember that base training is, is training non specifically for the race that you're doing. So I do this with my hands because specifically for the race that you're doing, that would be training at near race pace for near race volume, right? Running a 5K race is pretty specific to a 5K and a marathon for a marathon. So that's specific. And then non-specific to that can be longer distances, but slower and shorter distances, but faster. Okay. And that's basically what a base training is. It's starting at these extremes. But one of the keys of base training is doing both of these extreme ends of the spectrum. And this is the muscle fiber type end of the spectrum, doing both of these at high volume. So when you're running easy, running a lot of it, and what does that do? When you run a lot of relatively easy running, it starts to carry over, doesn't it? If you run at a very easy pace for yourself, but you do it for 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles, you just keep on going, that pace becomes more difficult. At some point, you wouldn't be able to keep that pace up anymore and you would just fall down, right? Or you'd have to slow down even more to just a walk or a sleep or something. So the more volume you do at even an easy pace, you get a carryover effect where you do train other fibers, but you have to do it at high volume. Second is when you do high volume of short stuff like strides and hill sprints, but when you do those at higher volume, there's a number of benefits, okay? But when you do them at a really high volume, you start to get a little bit of a carryover effect as well with the faster twitch fibers. I mean, if you did 20 hundred meter strides at your mile pace every day, if you did that, don't you think that your mile race time would get better? I mean, just logically, intuitively. Well, of course it would. So even your anaerobic Met metabolic systems and your twitch fibers that are like a little bit slower, they're still gonna get trained. Hey there, do you wanna know how you can get some free running socks either for yourself or to give away as a gift this holiday season? Well, all you need to do is purchase the Run Elite book and then you send us a little email with a screenshot of your purchase and we send you a free pair of the number one running sock in the country, the Features Run Elite socks. You get them completely for free, but this is coming to a close. You only have a few days left. This ends on November 30th because we have to send them out to you before the holidays. So make sure that you grab your book now and do this before the end of the month. So here's the power of base training when you only do it, okay? I'm gonna tell you the theory behind it and then at least three examples. The theory behind it is that you can do it indefinitely without getting hurt, without burning out, without getting injured. Why is that? Well, because your easy running is easy. You're less likely to get hurt if you're running easy. I think we can all agree. You have less impact, less range of motion, less stress on your body. So obviously you'll get less injury if you're running easier, even if you do more of it, because you can just go even easier and do more, right? And when you run fast, but you do a short amount of it, well, your injury risk also goes down because it's only a short amount. And when you do it on an uphill, it goes down even more because there's less impact, there's less range of motion as you go uphill. So injury risk goes way down. You never burn out because, I mean, I guess you could get bored with base training. I don't, I love base training but you could get bored with it in theory, but you won't burn out because you're not burning anything out. You're not really going to the max ever in anything. It's mostly pretty easy. So you can do it forever at a high level. And that right there is the key. It's really the main key in distance running, isn't it? We like to glorify the big workouts, the marathon pace workouts, the tempo runs, the races, the tune-up races, because we like to think we're like pushing hard. Pro you probably believe that when it comes to race day, that you can summon the fury, that you can push hard. And I think most runners think that. So pushing hard in the race isn't really where the level up is done. And it's not pushing hard in training either, because you can only push so hard in training before you get injured, burnt out, or plateau. So it's a slow drip of consistency over a long time. And there are periods of harder training, and there are periods of really pushing in a race, for sure. 
But really what makes any runner much better is their consistency over time. Over a year or over multiple years, what did they do during the week and month to month? How consistent were they? What was their volume in a six month period? What was their speed development in a six month period? And that's gonna be more indicative of what they're gonna race on race day over someone who only kind of half-assed those things, but sure did do some hard workouts and push those mile intervals in the two months leading up to the race, right? So here's how it works out for you. Let me tell you a real quick story with myself, and then I'll give you uh, three of you who are on here, and we'll, we'll go kind of fast with this. So with myself, I was a, a serious like road marathoner uh, a decade or so ago, and every year I'd run a peak race, and I would I would train as much as I could, and for track and cross country back in high school and college and stuff like that, I'd train really hard, push it every day, because we hear things like, you know, we watch the Prefontaine documentary and they say, Prefontaine, he got on the track every day. He worked out twice a day and he pushed it and brought it every day. And it's like, did he really? I mean, I mean, Prefontaine, I'm not gonna take anything away from him, what a guy, but I doubt he was busting his lungs twice a day, every single day. I mean, you can go look at his training log in the Nike headquarters in Eugene, Oregon, and you can see what he was doing. 10 mile easy run. Ooh, what's that? That's not busting his lungs every day. It's a 10 mile easy run. A second run of the day, that's a shakeout run. Five mile easy. He's not busting it every single day. He just busts it sometimes. Okay. So with myself, I had found that training really hard was leading me to injuries. And I had injury after injury after injury until eventually I got to the point where I did base training. Finally, oh, this story is in the book as well. I talk about it being winter in New Hampshire and it was really cold and I'm out there running and there's ice everywhere. So I had to run really slow, but I found this one sunny hill where there wasn't any ice. It was really short and I did hill sprints and that's it. I was only running 50 miles a week, but easy and hill sprints. And I went and I ran a lifetime PR in the half marathon at the time by almost two minutes. Then, then better from there once I figured that out. So base training can lead you to your lifetime best time. That's the take home point here. And, and if that's hard to believe, let me give you some more evidence for that. Okay, uh, Carl, he's part of our Boston Academy group. Carl is in his 60s, early to mid 60s. And he joined uh, Running Lee in January of this year. And he only just started about three weeks ago to do his support training. So that means he spent about nine months in base training. He was patient. And then he did a couple of fun tune-up races um, about three weeks ago and four weeks ago. So at the end of base training, only base training, he's been running his whole life and he's in his 60s. And the first race was a half marathon. And he thought he was going too fast in the half marathon. So he slowed down and he realized this is just a fun run. I don't want to go for a PR. So he slowed it down and he dogged it the last couple of miles. And he still ran a lifetime personal record in the half marathon without even trying, trying to slow himself down. And then two weeks later, he ran another half marathon, boom, broke his half marathon lifetime PR again, because he was trying that time. But it was still not even with specific training or even support training is the end of base training in his 60s, half marathon PR, half marathon PR. I want you to hear about Dean. Dean is on this call right now. Hey, Dean. And Dean, let me know if I get the story right. I think you've messaged me twice. One of them was a couple weeks ago, and you said that you took a minute off of your 10K time after only a couple weeks of base training because you changed your diet and you had let go of doing the in-between runs and started doing base training. And after just, I think you even said one week, but a couple, let's say a couple weeks, even to be fair, uh, you took a minute off your 10K. How's that possible? Well, you let go of some things. You were able to recover. You started doing the things that kind of matter early on, okay, lifetime. Then you just emailed me last night and said, you just ran a PR, a lifetime PR in the 10 miler. And you had raced it earlier this, this year, I think the same course, and you went over a minute faster. And, it, and we've only been working together for what, like not that long even. And you're just in base training. So lifetime PR, apples to apples, because you raced that same course less than a year ago. Like um, I think it was like, what, six months ago. So that's how quickly things can change. And then I want to finish here with the story of Maryland. I'm not going to give a whole history of, of Maryland's training, but I will say this, that uh, when Maryland joined Run Elite, she ran a lifetime PR in the marathon. It was nice. It was great. And there's a nice little testimonial from her on the website. But then there was like a two year period or so where Marilyn was running well for a bit and then getting hurt and then running well for a bit and getting hurt. And it was kind of like this up and down thing. And there wasn't a lifetime PR that came out of out of any of this in, in like a year and a half or a two year period. There was some good running, but there wasn't a PR that was coming. But I'll tell you this. Finally, she shook 
this uh, cycle of injury that she was in for a good while and has had a period of training over the last like three months that were, were not even spectacular, full support training, full specific training, giant workouts, double blocks, sarcomere runs. It wasn't even all of that, a little tiny bit of it, but really what had changed was that she just got consistent again. And instead of leveling up a ton, she just leveled up a little bit, but slow burned it for a few months and stayed injury free for like a number of months where she hadn't been before. So hear that, right? Just consistency over a handful of months without big, huge workouts. And she did do some workouts. Don't, let's not negate those here, but they weren't like the big workouts that she really wanted. It was just a slow burn. And just uh, this past weekend, um, I won't steal much of her thunder so she can tell you, but I'll tell you that she ran a PR. It was a good race. I, I did get over a minute PR, so I didn't expect it. So anyway, I'm happy with it. And we had been working together for a long time. She'd, she'd run really well and then had been struggling for a while and then was able to do it. How? Off of just consistency with mostly base training. So that's four examples right there. Three of you, one of me. I could give you more if you want. But the point of me giving you these examples is that I want you to focus on base training above all else. It's not as glorious, but it does work. You can run really well and even the best in the world. Um, I talk about Kenny Nisabakele, who was not in this race, but you know, within the last Olympiad, he's been at the top of the world. Uh, I think three years ago, two years ago or three years ago, he ran the second fastest marathon ever in Berlin. This guy's really good. And what does he do most of the time? Well, he does these big workouts. And if you look at what is Kenanisa Bekele's training, if you Google that, you'll probably find these big workouts that he's doing a month before and two months before the big race. Yeah, sure. So he does that for a month or two before the big race. But most of his training is high volume, very easy, with about two miles worth of strides every other day for months and months and months and months at four minute pace. That's what he does. And he ran a world record in the 5K, the 10K, second fastest ever in the marathon. Greatest cross country runner of all time, hands down, no argument there. Works for them, works for me, works for you guys, works for elite runners. Let's not forget the power of base training. And the only reason we sometimes do forget the power of base training is because we're tempted, we're seduced by the big workouts that, that make us feel like we're a real badass. So go ahead and do those as well. But I would save those for later in your training to where you can do them to where they really are big workouts because you have this foundation. So you can do, instead of five by one mile, you can do 10 by one mile at the same pace or more because you have all that fitness. So don't waste those big efforts early on when you can't do that big of an effort anyway build up the foundation, stay injury free, stay consistent. And then when it comes time to do the big workouts that really shift that marathon fitness, that 5k fitness, whatever it is, when it comes time to do those, now we do them and you'll actually get the benefit of it. Okay. Base training is so powerful that in this video here, I'm going to share with you after you do your base training, how do you stack on other kinds of runs beyond that in order to really maximize what you've done so that you can build to a true peak. And we're going to break down for you the full idea of what kinds of training you should be doing at different phases in your training. I know that you're going to love this video. It's going to break down an entire concept for you for how to structure your workouts. I'm going to get that right here.